like to welcome everybody today on behalf of the North Ray Police Department of Town of North Reading um, and our community impact team. This is a very important topic and we have uh, the pleasure of having the DA herself here to present today. I want to acknowledge the town administrator is here, uh, members of the Board of Selectmen and our community impact team, as well as the seniors here, which um, this presentation is geared to. So I'm just going to read the um, introduction of the DA um, who has been a great partner of not only the North Rank Police Department but the North Rank Community Impact Team. She continues to provide the resources um, for us to improve the quality of life in this community. Um, and, it, and it's a partnership that has gotten stronger over the years. Uh, when I became chief in 2012, um, she was right there. Um, you know, she wasn't a DA at the time, but right there supporting us. And then when she became DA, she reached out and, and offered us whatever we needed. So we continue to run programs like this, um, not only here, but throughout the Middlesex County, we're willing to participate with anything that her office does. So she is a career prosecutor with significant courtroom experience, having prosecuted many of Middlesex County's most complex and challenging cases. She's responsible for the prosecution of approximately 40,000 cases a year in all 54 cities and towns of Middlesex County. She's recognized for her leadership on the opiate crisis and her innovative programs that address all aspects of substance abuse um, and addiction, including prosecution, prevention, and treatment. And from her experience, she's learned that as important as prosecution is, prevention is equally as important and leads to a better outcome. She's recognized as an expert on developing and creating innovative solutions that are defined not by simply getting involved after the criminal act but occurred, but instead taking meaningful steps to stop crime before it happens. So we're very fortunate to have DA Ryan here to present today, keeping our seniors safe in the opioid crisis. So please welcome the Middlesex District Attorney, Mary Moore. Thank you, Mr. and thank you for having us today. You know, the Chief mentioned the partnership, and you know, I say all the time, I'm very fortunate to be the District Attorney in Middlesex County. So one of the best parts of that is the partnerships that I have with our police departments, with our police chiefs, with our town officials, with the police departments themselves. We could not do the important work that we do without that support. And Chief Murphy is one of the best. I call him whatever we need. Somehow he manages to make it happen. So, and you know, we shouldn't lose sight of we're at a time when people wonder about government and what's it all doing for you. You look at who's here today, you know, your town administrator, the chairman of the board, the selected members of the board, nothing bad's happened. And they're here just to make sure you stay safe. And that's not true across the state and across the country. So we're very, very fortunate in Middlesex County to have those kind of partnerships and that kind of concern. So today, what we're gonna talk about, and I hope you're gonna learn some things um, in, in about different issues. Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit first about the scope of the opiate problem, kind of what it started out as, how we got to where we are, and then be very detailed for you about what are some of the things you can do to protect yourself, what are some of the things you can do to help somebody that you might know that's struggling with addiction. And the one thing I ask really is that you take this information, but my goal is always for everybody who's here, I'm sure you know four or five people who couldn't be here, either because they just couldn't make it or they're not well enough to be here or something. Take the information back to them. We have lots and lots of material. My goal is to educate everybody so they can keep themselves safe. And then when I'm done talking about this, and I will have been sort of doing the big picture of what's going on, I'm fortunate enough to have um, Carrie Ann Kilcoyne here with us, who has just been an amazing partner with us. Um, I first met Carrie Ann when she was in the drug court and really had struggled very hard with addiction. It is amazing to me to look at her today and see where she has come to. She's now working in the recovery field herself, has turned her personal life around, gotten married while I've known her, has just, she's the success story that we want everyone to get to who's been struggling with addiction. And she's gonna talk a little bit from her personal experience, but also as it affected her own family, because this really is a family disease. But let's start a little bit talking about the scope of this problem. And you know, we talk all the time about the numbers, because that's how we measure how we're doing. But we never lose sight of the fact that when we talk about those numbers, every single one of those numbers is somebody's son or daughter. 
somebody's brother or sister, more often than we like to think about now, somebody's parent who's lost their life or who's struggling. So in no way do we leave aside the part that this is very personal for so many people. But this map that you see here is a map that we started tracking. So let me give you an idea if you're not familiar with it. Middlesex County is comprised of these 54 cities and towns. Middlesex County, the population, is bigger than 11 states in the country. We're just about 1.7 million people spread across those 54 cities and towns. And in addition, we have 26 colleges and universities. So that means in addition to everybody who's here, every September, we have a whole influx of people. And I'll talk a little bit about this later, but also those people are often at the age that they're experimenting using substances, so that's a different issue for us. And if you look at every single mark that's on there, it represents somebody who lost their life to an overdose. And the, the problem with this is, the real issue that started for us is, of those 1.6 million people, then 1.6 million, now almost 1.7, um, in 2012, across the entire county, we had 65 people die from an opiate overdose. And that was a big jump from the year before, where a number had been in the high 30s. That was the first time I started to say, you know, something's going on here. And as you might imagine, if you're familiar with the county, the first place we started seeing it was up here in the Merrimack Valley, the Lowell took spree drank it. That's where it first started. So we started a task force up in Lowell and started addressing that through our partnerships with everyone involved in this. And it seemed at that point that almost no matter what we were doing to try to tamp things down, you know, all of the things like drug disposal boxes and Narcan and all of those pieces, we couldn't get those numbers to stop going up. So much so, as you can see, and it's a little bit small, but last year, for the calendar year 2016, we were up to 251 people who died. So from 65 to 251 in the three and a half year period is a big, big jump. Now, the good news is that since December of 2016, we have started to see our numbers at first stabilize and now go down. So we now, across Middlesex County, have seen a decline in the number of our fatal overdoses. And particularly up in that epicenter, the Merrimack Valley area, that decline is very significant. It is not solely attributable, which is some people always wonder, are we just Narcanning more people so they don't die? We are Narcanning more people, but that number doesn't make up for it. So we're clearly pushing the number in the right direction. And that really is because of the strength of those partnerships. So you see that number, and you look at, right now, there are only eight cities and towns that have not experienced an overdose. So it is everywhere. It really knows no boundaries whatsoever. The other thing that's kind of interesting is if you took one of those um, plastic sheet maps, you know, the clear things that showed you the highways, state highways, and you put that on over this, you would see that a certain number of them are cities and towns that have a higher number than you might think of because they are at the intersection of a lot of highways. So lots of people are arranging to make a buy. You know, they need to get something. They've arranged to meet, make a buy. They're doing that at a McDonald's or a Dunkin' Donuts right off the highway, using in the bathroom often and, and overdosing. So for instance, you look at places like up here in Pepperell, those are the roads going right up into Vermont. You look down here in Newton, which you wouldn't expect to have such a high number, but you've got the Mass Pike, you've got 128. So a lot of those deaths are happening to people who happen to be in that city or town, but may not necessarily be connected to that. So that gives you some sense of what we've been dealing with in terms of the problem. And this is just sort of a bar graph of that, and it shows you how many of those are heroin. And what's significant is that these 65 overdoses in 2012 only 20 of them, so less than a third, were heroin related. You look over here at 2016, we're at 168, and many of those we haven't gotten back from the medical examiner's office yet. So my guess would be that this will go up to about 200. So almost all of them, heroin really became the drug of choice during that period of time. Then, you know, many of you will recognize that poppy, beautiful flower. That is really the source of our problem. And poppies are grown now in primarily in Mexico and Afghanistan, and they are really grown not for their beauty, but solely because they are the source of opiates. 
And let me just kind of just divide up that <coughs> issue, if you will. Many people get confused between opiates and opioids, and people think it's the same word and they switch back and forth. This is the distinction. Opiates are the natural, actual compound that is an opiate. And that comes from the poppy plant. So if you take the bulb of the poppy plant and you break that open, you get that sticky white sap that's inside, that contains three <coughs> different opiates. The first is codeine, which most people know that, cough, primarily used as a cough suppressant. The second is thebane. That's the opiate that's used to do oxycodone, oxycontin. It's the active ingredient. And finally, what everybody's heard of is morphine. It is from morphine that you get heroin. So morphine, which is named after the Greek god of dreams, so even back thousands of years ago when they named it morphine, they knew that it had some power to kind of make you floaty, not in your right mind, kind of dreamlike state. And for, in the medical field, morphine is used as the measure of a painkiller. So it's the gold standard, if you will. Every other painkiller is half as strong as morphine, a quarter as strong as morphine. That's how you measure it. So, Keep this piece in mind. Think about morphine. That's at the top of the pyramid of painkillers. Right? Many of the fentanyls and heroines that we are seeing now are 50 to 100 times stronger than that. That really is why people got it, because the stuff is just so strong that's out there on the street. So those are the only true things, <coughs> those three. And then think about if you're growing poppies, you, we want to grow a lot of plants, right? You have to have land. And you can only grow as much as you have land to do. And growing is a certain cycle. You gotta plant the seeds, they grow, you harvest them, you gotta tear them up, you have to replant. So that's gonna be a limit on how much you can get. So remember, this is a cash business, lots of money to be made. The faster I can get those opiates, rather than waiting whatever the cycle is for a poppy to grow, that's what leads us to get to the semi-synthetic opiates. So semi-synthetic opiates is that I take some natural opiate, whether it be the thebane or morphine, and I add something else to it to make the drug. All right, so now I only need half as much as maybe or a quarter as much as I needed. So one poppy plant is now worth three, four times as much to me. Some of the popular semi-synthetics are the oxycodone, oxycontin, all of that whole family which I talked about, those all come from thebane. So thebane's the natural opiate you use, and then you add whatever you add to it to get to that. Um, Vicodin, if you've ever taken Vicodin, that's a natural opiate plus a man-made material. Dilaudin and heroin. Heroin is morphine plus whatever you're gonna add to it. If I wanna do even better than that, and I don't wanna have to wait for those poppies to grow at all, I do totally man-made opiates, the synthetic opiates, the most popular of which are fentanyl, which some people may be familiar with. It's used as a painkiller, a time-release painkiller. You often get it if you've had some kind of procedure done where you've had pain in a large part of your body. <coughs> so often somebody, for instance, who's had spinal surgery, pain over a big area, they'll do a fentanyl patch. Pain relievers released over time. It numbs or reduces the pain in a big area. And then methadone, which can be used to wean somebody off of heroin. Right? So those have none of the natural opiate. They are man-made. Now, the question is, and people ask me this all the time, like how did this get so out of control? How did we ever get here? And there's really a pretty straightforward explanation. Opiate painkillers were developed to treat end-of-life pain. No one was confused about whether they were addictive. But you had people that had terrible end stage, kidney cancer, um, liver cancer, whatever it might have been. They only had two or three weeks to live. They were in excruciating pain. Morphine wasn't working for them. You know, somebody who's in the hospital who's got the morphine pump <coughs> and it's just not working. We now have these great, stronger medications that will reduce their pain. And we're not worried that they're gonna get addicted because they're only living 21 more days. So that's not an issue. And the other interesting fact, you know, things in time always have a relationship. The time that all these painkillers are coming into the forefront, kind of the mid to late 80s, early 90s, 
is also the time period when a good thing that's developing is sort of hospice home care. All right, so at that same time, it's becoming popular to have somebody with one of these end-stage illnesses be able to do, you know, what all of us would want to do, be able to go back to our home, die with some degree of dignity with our family around. That's not such an attractive option if the person's screaming in pain 23 hours a day. So we want people to be able to go home, be cared for at home. These opiate medications help to make that possible because they made the pain manageable. So that's the good start, right? So we've got over here with the end of life treatment. And then the idea is that for people with chronic, especially pain associated with cancer, that level of pain relief could be helpful. So we start prescribing them for them. Then the thought is, well, these are such good painkillers, such strong, quick-acting painkillers. What about when somebody has an acute episode? You know, you fall off a ladder, you break your arm and your leg. You're in excruciating pain. Maybe they can't set the bone that day. What are we going to do with you? Opiate painkillers are good for that. One of the things that opiate painkillers became very useful for and is still used by pretty much every obstetrician is when somebody has a cesarean section. All right? So if somebody has a cesarean, they have an abdominal incision, but within a couple of days, they've got to get up and take care of a baby. You've got to be able to get past that pain. So pretty much everybody who has a C-section leaves with a prescription from their OBGYN for opiate painkillers, and we like that, right? So it lets you go home, you can take care of your baby, the pain is manageable. But just keep this in mind in terms of dosage. The average OBGYN is sending somebody home who's just had that incision, who's gonna be hopping up and down taking care of their baby, with a prescription for about 75 milligrams over five or six days. Right? People in active addiction might well be at 200 milligrams a day. So think about that in terms of the dosage. And then really how we get to the big problem is this middle ground right here. And that in part is a societal piece. You know, I would suggest to you that if anybody in here went to their doctor today and the doctor said, you know, you have to have a procedure on your knee, your shoulder, whatever it is, and what's going to be required after you do, you know, it's an outpatient procedure, you'll come in, we'll do it, you'll go home in the afternoon, and what you're going to need to do to recover, you're not going to be able to do anything. You're going to just have to sit on the couch for six weeks, right? The first thing that most of us would be saying is, I can't do that. I need to drive, I need to go to work, I need to do this. How am I going to do that? And the bridge from you've got that kind of pain to being able to have some normal life during that period of time is an opiate painkiller, all right? That's why the people that get those prescriptions is because you want to go back to work, you want to drive. One of the biggest groups we see affected by opiate addiction is people in the trades, right? I'm a plumber, I'm a bricklayer, whatever it is. They are likely to get hurt at work. They often are self-employed. They don't work, they don't get paid. So if I'm a plumber and I've hurt my shoulder, I really can't take six weeks of sitting on the couch not being able to work. I need something to get me back to work so I can be doing my job. That can be accomplished with opiates. But some people are gonna get addicted to those opiates. And the reflection of that is this graph which shows you the beginning in 1992 when opiates <coughs> first are kind of hitting their stride. In the United States, 76 million prescriptions were written, right? That's not the number of pills, that's how many prescriptions were written for those. By 2013, and this number just, if you graph it out, it keeps going up, 207 million prescriptions were being written. I'm not thinking people got a lot sicker, right? It just became more and more of a need to have whatever I need done, I gotta get back to work, the kids had something done, they can't miss their AP class, they need a prescription to go to school. So there's some piece of that that really is our societal view that we don't have time to be sick. I'm sick, I gotta get something that gets me back to work. Then you look at how you get from the opiate to a heroin addiction. So this 50 milligram opiate pill right here, and I guess some of you probably either have or have had that kind of a prescription, pretty average opiate painkiller. Right now, that pill is selling on the street for about a dollar a milligram. So that pill's worth $50, right? So the way this addiction usually goes is, I get prescribed opiates. 
if everybody in this room got prescribed opiates, some people would take them and say, they made me sick to my stomach, I hate those, I'm never taking those again. Some people would take them and say, yep, they worked for me, I spent a week on them, my knee healed up, all done, back to work. And some people are going to take them and they love them. Right? And they're going to be taking them and taking them and taking them. And so the other piece that's important to know about opiates is that your tolerance develops very, very quickly. So if 50 worked for you two weeks ago, now you need 100 to get to where 50 got you two weeks ago. Because that tolerance just builds really, really quickly. So now I got my prescription. This is the usual path. I got my prescription from my orthopedist. Set. I really like these. I finished the 30 he gave me. I need some more. <laughs> Typically, I'm going to go back to the doctor and I'm going to ask for more painkillers. I still got some pain. I still got pain in my knee, doctor. Right? It's interesting that the two biggest over prescribers of opiates are orthopedists and dentists. Again, pain that it's really hard to measure. You have dental work done and you go back and you say, Doc, my mouth is killing me when I try to chew. You can't really measure that pain. You tell me you have pain, I kind of have to believe you. You tell me that every time you get out of the chair, your knee is so painful, I kind of have to believe you that you're having that pain. All right. So typically, I'm going to be able to get my doctor to write me one, maybe two more scripts um, for the injury I, or the operation I have. And maybe those scripts are 30, 60, 90 pills, whatever it is. So now I've got myself out a period of time. But remember, at the same time I'm taking them, my tolerance is going up. So now I'm taking them faster. Eventually, my doctor, no matter who it is, is probably going to say, yeah, it's, you're done. I'm not writing anymore. You need to be off those. So I'm probably, first of all, going to shop around a little bit and see if I can get another doctor to write me some scripts. Right? I mentioned before the colleges and universities that we have. What we often have seen is we have kids who come to college here. Right? They go to college in some, place, some college in Newton, for instance. They get hurt. They play in lacrosse. They get hurt. They go to the Newton Wells. Orthopedist writes them some scripts for the injury. Maybe they can get two, three scripts out of there. And now they need them, need them, need them. But on Friday, they can go home to Providence and go see their, their family physician or their pediatrician or whoever it is, get another script. Right? So we have lots of colleges, room, college rooms that we'd respond to and find kids with several hundred pills that they'd managed to collect around. That's why we supported the change in the physician management program that happened in September, late September, that linked 46 states. Because before that, even if I was using it in Massachusetts, I was somebody writing a script, and used it, I could only see what somebody got in Massachusetts. So, you know, we avoided by lots of places where kids come here to go to school. They, they drive home to New Hampshire, they were getting another hundred of those. So, at some point, I've shopped around. You know, another big source of them is these pop-up little clinics, the bone and joint clinics, those kinds of things, where nobody spends a whole lot of time with you. They don't know you the way your family physician does. Emergency rooms are a place where people were getting a lot. We filed some legislation that ended up getting wrapped into the governor's opioid bill about limiting the amount that you could get in an emergency room for a prescription because, you know, you fall and break your leg on Friday. Nobody wants you to suffer all weekend. And maybe you won't get to see your doctor or the surgeon or whatever until Monday or Tuesday. You probably don't need 90 days worth of painkillers because you ought to be getting that fixed before you need those 90 days. But eventually, I'm going to run out of places that are going to write me a script. Typically what people are then doing is they're going to try to borrow them. They're going to try to buy them from their friends. Again, on the college campuses, you know, we have lots of kids who come to college with a legitimate prescription, maybe for attention deficit or many other conditions. Maybe they have some kind of mental health issue, they have a prescription. Over half the kids on our college campuses tell us that they have been approached to either give or sell some of their prescriptions to people. So I'm going to be shopping around looking for some of those, all right? But it's going to be costing me somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 every time. So not many people are going to be able to support. I need, you know, three or four of these every day. And maybe I can't really work too well because I'm taking so many opiates. I'm going to run out of money from doing that. 
So it's going to be a pretty quick drop to a cheap substitute, which is heroin. In one of the consumer trends that has not been good for anybody, and the officers and the chief know this as well, when I started in the DA's office maybe 30 years ago, a bag of heroin like that on the street was probably $60. Right now, that bag is somewhere between $3 and $5. So 50 bucks for the pill, $5 for the bag of heroin. You know, one of the impacts you see of that, you probably see if you look in your local paper, most towns, every once in a while we'll have that whole scourge of people going up and down the street, opening car doors, scooping the change, you know, an unlocked car in the driveway, scooping the change when we used to pay tolls that everybody kept in the cup holder or the ashtray. And I live in a town where we get hit with that every couple of weeks. And you'll look in the news, the town paper, and there'll be, you know, the, the car at 65 Ronald Road, 67, 69, everybody got their car cleaned out. And one day my husband was reading that and he said, I, I don't understand this, they're only getting three or four bucks a car. Well, that's the price of the bank tower. Mm -hmm. right? So that's not a coincidence that that's where people are going. So that's what drives people to that. And the thing that's interesting is the doctors will tell you that somebody who's using pills, if they can sustain it, if somehow either they have the resources or they have access to them, they might be using pills for years, upping their dosage, but using them for a long time. Once somebody gets to heroin, the time from when they're snorting it to they're injecting it is measured in weeks or months, it's not years. So it's a pretty quick, again, because you need more and more, you want it faster and faster, and injecting it is the quickest way to get the high from that. So that's sort of the route that people are taking. Now, obviously, most of us know the health effects of some of this, you know, you get that physical dependence and the, because your tolerance fills up. Then you eventually develop what is known in the physician's um, manual as actual substance abuse disorder, which really is what I always characterize. It, addiction is really a disease of disorganization. People who are addicted, their sole goal becomes getting what they need. From the time they wake up in the morning, the plan is, what am I going to do about how I'm going to get it? And they abandon everything else. They abandon their job, they abandon their kids, their marriage, everything else, because their sole goal is that. And that's what's really characterized as substance use disorder. And then the more you use, it's risky. Obviously, the likelihood that you're eventually going to have an overdose and potentially a fatal overdose. I was at um, one of the drug court graduations yesterday, and four young men had completed the program. And between the four of them, they had had over 50 overdoses. Right? And the path to recovery, all of them had overdosed in, ex in excess of 10 times and been revived. So, you know, it just escalates. Now, in terms of what people associate with, I'm not sure what's going on with somebody and should I be suspecting a substance disorder. Obviously, money missing is a key factor. You know, lots of times somebody who's living with somebody who's got an addiction, you start thinking you're crazy yourself. You go to the bank, you take out 420s, and then next, tomorrow, you look in your wallet, it's three, and you're thinking, did I stop at Dunkin' Donuts? Did I use that 20? Where'd the other 20 go? Money's just disappearing from wherever. Um, the same thing with credit cards. You see it stuff showing up on credit cards, your credit card's disappearing. Um, somebody can be using that to get that cash to support their habit. These are some of the, the less well-known things, things disappearing that are valuable, like jewelry, um, you know, lots of times people will tell us in hindsight, you know, I started noticing my watch, my earrings were gone. You always think you put them somewhere else. No, they're really gone. Um, the spoons, you go to a learn to cope meeting, everybody will tell you. Every parent who didn't realize there was an addiction will tell you they started noticing the spoons were disappearing in the house. Or the spoons were getting bent. The bowl of the spoon was all bent because somebody was cooking heroin in the bowl of that spoon. I was at a learn to cope meeting one day where a mother said, spoons were just disappearing like crazy, teaspoons. So, you know, the dishwasher can only eat so many of those. And she said, she kept thinking what was happening was that their, her adolescent kids were taking big buckets of ice cream at night and using the spoon, you know, instead of a scoop to dig it out, that's why her spoons were bending. And then she thought they were taking bowls of ice cream off to the family room and somehow the spoon wasn't making its way back, right? Sometimes we really don't think about that, sometimes deny, right, after you've lost enough of those spoons. Um, tin foil, tin foil's the common method of wrapping. 
substances to keep them from getting wet. So you suddenly roll the tin foil and disappearing around the house. I don't know what's up with that. And then finally, prescriptions themselves start not necessarily the whole bottle, but things are disappearing from the bottle. Um, the other thing that people may notice is things that are seasonal disappear in the off season. So we'll have a lot of people who will go take, you know, their grandmother's lawnmower in the winter, sell it for a couple of hundred bucks to support their habit, knowing that nobody's going to miss the lawnmower until it comes to be April or May. Same thing with the snow blowers. You know, lots of snow blowers disappear during the summer. Get a couple of hundred bucks, nobody's going to notice that for a while. And this is just sort of a constellation of things that happen. You've obviously got the physical issues that are happening, and then the emotional and social. You know, people becoming much more withdrawn and moody, not being interested in the things they used to be interested in. You know, part of this that sometimes makes it hard, especially for parents with teenage kids, is that's part of being a normal teenager, right? Normal teenagers are moody. They change their mind about who they like. They don't want to do this anymore. They used to play lacrosse. They hate lacrosse now. So there's a part of that that is just sort of normal behavior, but you gotta be watching for all of those things because you start seeing that constellation. If you got a kid who only wants to hang out in their room, isn't interested in any of their old friends, and all your spoons are disappearing, you probably hit the trifecta there. And then looking to how it affects people over the, you know, what we qualify as seniors, people over the age of 60. And the first and foremost is the theft. Um, being exploited. Number one, because when you get to be over 60, you probably have lots of what people who are addicted are looking for. You probably have medication, and you probably have some assets. So either you've got some property, some jewelry, whatever that people can touch, or the other unfortunate thing is that most people tend to have some monthly income. So even if you're living close on your own money, you know, you're getting your Social Security and that just kind of covers your expenses. You get your Social Security check at the beginning of the month. If I'm your granddaughter or niece who's hitting you up for money, I can come over on the third of the month and hit you up for 20 bucks. And maybe it's a strain for you to give me the 20 bucks. But you love me, I'm your granddaughter, you give me the 20 bucks. Come the third of June, I can pop up again because I know you just got another pile of money. And I'm just going to be chiseling that away. We have a, you might have seen a couple last week, there was some publicity about a case that we're prosecuting where exactly that was happening. Young man, very deep in addiction, had an uncle. He was his godfather. They were close. He would come over once in a while and, you know, go pick up a bag of groceries for him or something. And he was always coming over just chiseling a little, little money 20, 25 bucks. Uncle didn't really have it, but he loved this kid. And there was always, as there is, a story, you know, the car broke down, I need to get something for one of my kids, I need whatever, and the uncle would dole out the $25. And he showed up one night in December a year ago and asked the uncle for the customary money, and the uncle said, I just, I just don't have it. Like, the heating bill's a little high this month, whatever, I, I just, I don't, I'm short myself, I can't give you the money. There's an argument back and forth, it becomes physical. Nephew throws the uncle through the door into the bathroom against the wall, bringing the tile down on the wall. Uncle didn't survive. So, you know, that chiseling away at things can often lead to an argument. We have an endless number of cases where somebody's telling us, I got pushed, I got shoved, I got slapped by my adult child or grandchild who I wouldn't give them the money. I, I got the credit card bill and I confronted them that they were using my credit card getting cash back. You know, we got into an argument, we got into a struggle, I got physical, and something bad happened. So there's that piece. And also just the manipulation and coercion of if you don't do this, what's gonna happen to me? Mm -hmm. You don't want me to have to go to jail. You don't want this to happen to me. I'm gonna get arrested if I go steal this from somebody else. Endless numbers of people telling us they just, they don't want to be ashamed. They don't want anything bad to happen. So they're doing things they don't want to do. They're signing over houses. They're doing all sorts of stuff, letting them use the car, whatever it is to kind of keep the peace and try to help the person out. The tampering with prescriptions is really kind of two things. You know, it's not likely that your whole bottle of medication is going to go missing. But I'm going to be clever enough, if I'm addicted, to be taking a handful. You know, you got four or five prescriptions. I'm taking a handful out of everything. 
And there's a few ways to keep yourself safe about that. And the first one starts back when you get the prescription. When you get a prescription, particularly if it's a prescription you haven't had before, you need to know what it is you are supposed to have. So if somebody swaps out your medication, you know that it's been swapped out. So you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I'm going to be putting you on whatever it is, oxycodone, whatever. Every single doctor has a physician's desk reference that has a photograph of every single medication that that doctor can prescribe, right? It's like the back of an encyclopedia. It's got about 85 colored pages with pictures of every pill that you can get a prescription for. You get a new prescription. You need to be saying to the doctor, nurse practitioner, whoever, let me see what I'm supposed to get. So you know what's going to be in your bottle when you pick it up at the prescription. Some of the pharmacies, um, for instance, Rite Aid and a couple of the others, put right on that slip that's hanging on the front of your bag. It will say you're getting a prescription for oxycodone, and it will say underneath, small white pill with G on the back and ABC on the front. So if you forgot to ask at the doctor's office, it tells you right on the bag what you're supposed to see inside that bag. Now, think about it. If I have an addiction and I need to get close to drugs, a good place for me to go work would be in a place where they have drugs. So one of the things you need to be doing is you pick up a prescription. When you leave with that prescription, make sure you got what you were supposed to get. If you were supposed to get 90 pills, count those out and make sure you have 90. And I was talking about this at some senior center and a woman right in front of us raised her hand and said, you know, I picked up my prescription today and I had 88 pills. So first you think, maybe I dropped it, maybe they dropped one. Okay, I'm short two, but I'm not driving back to Rite Aid because it's all the way across town to get my two pills, all right? But you need to be calling the pharmacy and letting them know that because Think about it, if I work at Rite Aid or Walgreens or something, and all day long, every time I fill a script, I slip two off the end, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I have a nice, healthy bottle of pills. So remember, they're worth 50 bucks a piece. I got a nice bottle of those pills. And then, if you count your prescription, so you got 90 pills, you count them, you have your 90, that's good. You need to keep track of them, because if you get to day 86 and you're out, you won't know when you lost any of them. So every week, every 10 days, you should count them up again. If you take one every day, you should only be down by seven a week. If you count them, you know, the day after your granddaughter visits and you're missing 10 pills, well, you need to be thinking about where they might have gone. So one piece is really just monitoring what you have. The second piece is keeping track of and getting rid of what you don't need. You know, in your package, you'll see we give you those little file of life cards that people fill out you put on the front of the refrigerator with all your information and they tell you to put your prescriptions in there in pencil because your doctor might change them what we really want you to do is get rid of those prescriptions when you're not taking them anymore because one of the partnerships we built because of this problem is we discovered that there were lots of people again I have an addiction I want to get close to pills so I spend Sunday afternoon going out to an open house open houses I come to the open house, I sign in as Mary Smith, I'm wandering through the house, the broker's letting me wander around. It's pretty easy to go into the bathroom, I open the medicine cabinet, I'm not saying anybody here might have these, but I know I used to have some in mine. There's those few bottles in the back that have a little dust on the lid, because they've been sitting there since you had that thing done three years ago, and you might need them so you hung on to them, all right? I open the medicine cabinet, I know if there's dust on them, you're not taking them. So if I pocket those prescriptions, you are never going to miss those. If you've got active prescriptions, you know, again, I'm probably not taking the whole bottle, but I'm taking two or three out of every box that I can find. By the end of Sunday afternoon, I can have a pretty good jar of pills. So, you know, one of the partnerships, as I said, we did was the real estate brokers to train people <laughs> that you wouldn't show your house with a stack of 50s on the counter. Same thing, you know, the prescriptions that you put in wherever you put them so you'll remember them, by the coffee pot or by your bed. We've trained folks to how to put those away when you're going to have somebody in. We um, had several cases in the last couple of months where people having cleaning people. After the cleaning people come, somebody looking at their prescriptions notices there's a few missing from every one of those jars. So just be conscious of what you have. We've provided the police departments with drug disposal boxes. You dump your pills in a plastic bag, no questions asked. 
24-7 go in and throw them in that box. The department gets rid of them. We get them burnt. They're gone. You know, if you've got young grandchildren or folks who might be experimenting, they're just not around for them to find. Often we have people that, um, you know, have either been able to age at home and have suddenly gone to live in some other facility or might have passed away from whatever was wrong with them. More houses than I have been in, than I can count. I have been in where there is literally a shoe box. For some reason, it's always a shoe box that's got all the prescriptions lined up in it. And folks, I had someone in my office just the other day say, my mother passed away over a year ago. I didn't know what to do with that box, so I just put it in the linen closet. All right, so what you can do with it is just get rid of them. All right, and that's the easy way to do it. <coughs> and you know, the other piece of it to think about is, not only if somebody's taking your prescriptions, are they helping themselves and fueling their own addiction, but if you're not taking your medication, you put yourself at a lot of risk. You're not taking your high blood pressure medication or whatever you need to be taking, you're much more at risk to fall, to have something go wrong with your heart, whatever it is. Even if you skip in a couple of days of some of those medications that folks are on. You know, maybe you get to day 88, you're missing the last couple of pills, your insurance isn't paying, so you think, oh, how bad can it be? I just won't take it for two days. That can have a lot of consequences for you. Um, the other piece, the pet piece, I honestly could not believe this story the first time I heard it. I was at a, a Learn to Cope meeting, and a woman came up to me, and, you know, which is for families of folks with addiction, and a woman came up to me, and she told me this story about the fact that she had a dog, which she had with her, a nice little dog, which she clearly doted on. And the dog had had some kind of a procedure done, and the vet had given her a prescription for that dog. And this woman was taking absolutely perfect care of the dog, giving it its pills, doing whatever. The dog wasn't getting better. Kept taking the dog back to the vet, couldn't figure out why the dog wasn't getting better. Eventually, the vet did a blood test on the dog, and the prescription medication was not in the dog's blood. When they looked at the vial, the prescription vial, it was filled with Tic Tacs had a granddaughter with an addiction, she poured out the pills, put Tic Tacs in the thing. What people forget is the FDA approves the same drugs for animals as it does for people. So if you have a dog that has surgery and it gets a gabapentin prescription, that is exactly the same gabapentin that any one of us would get prescribed. And that's a big piece for us in this county because obviously across the county, I have people who have cats and dogs, you know, household pets that they're taking care of. In the middle of the county, we have a big strip of towns where people all breed and raise ho and ride horses. I have come to learn that horses are incredibly delicate animals. They require all kinds of prescriptions. They are big. Their prescriptions are big. And then out in the western part of the county, I've got lots of people who have big livestock. Um, you know, we have buffalo farms. We have lots of people who raise cows out there. Again, they're big. They get big prescriptions. So, for instance, when you read in the newspaper that vet offices have been broken into at night, you know, they're in a strip mall and they broke into the vet office, it's not that they're there to get the money out of the register, they're there to get the gab of pet for one of those things. So, that's, you know, at some level it speaks to the growth of addiction because <coughs> you're actually taking the dog's medicine. Um, but it's just a piece that, you know, people aren't mm. aware of that, they're not thinking about it. So, we've now partnered with um, the Massachusetts Veterinary Society. I put a letter in that. I just spoke at their conference to have vets be talking to folks about, you know, all right, I don't suspect the 80-year-old Mrs. Jones of having an addiction, but I need to know whether Mrs. Jones is living with her granddaughter who's got a raging addiction and what kind of script I should be writing for that. And let me just also point out, you know, one of the things, as I said earlier, addiction doesn't discriminate in any way. And we certainly have a significant portion of senior population that people have developed an addiction. And that's something nobody wants to talk about. I was out doing this presentation somewhere, and a woman came up to me afterwards and said she lived in a senior housing building, and she was very worried about the woman living across the hall from her, who was clearly addicted to her pain medication. And people don't want to think that somebody who's you know in their 80s has got an addiction it's probably also more likely that they're going to get the doctor to write a few more scripts because the doctor doesn't want to think about that either. But it puts them at incredible risk to being hurt. It aggravates all kinds of other physical issues. And there's ways to deal with that. So people don't want to report that. They don't want to think that's true. They want to think, you know, something else is wrong with grandma. It can't be an addiction. There's no 
nothing that says that somebody isn't developing the same physical tolerance and use and addiction as somebody who's 25. And in fact, unfortunately, what we have seen is the age of people, especially people experiencing overdoses, is going up. People think of this as a disease of, you know, 20 year olds. It really isn't. The average age of a fatal overdose now in Middlesex County is somewhere between 35 and 38. Um, and we see people coming. We have somebody in the drug court up in Lowell who's well into their 70s. And the person said, I've been an addict for 40 years. I really don't want to die an addict. That's why I'm doing the drug court now. So, you know, when you see all those signs, don't just say, well, they're old. That can't be true. So that person needs help just as much. And then the other piece is just the familial impact. You know, addiction is a family disease. It affects everybody in the family. I talked a little bit about how the grandparents get manipulated into taking in the adult children or the grandchildren, and it's impacting kids. Terrible impact on kids. And colliding both of those, right now in Massachusetts, we have 34,000 kids who are being raised by their grandparents. Of that 34,000, 80% or 30,000 are, are in that position because of opiates. Either the parents have died of an overdose or the parents are in a position where they can't parent and the grandparents have gotten the kids. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've had two situations where we've been <coughs> reaching out to grandparents in another state. The call that maybe they were expecting, your child has overdosed, but the second part of that call they probably weren't prepared for, and your grandchildren need you to come get them. So you think about being at an age where you're willing to kind of just, you're ready to kind of just settle back and enjoy yourself and have some time, and suddenly you've got maybe babies, preschoolers, teenagers moving in for you. It's got consequences at every possible level. There's the, first of all, you know, you're living in senior housing. You didn't expect to have three kids come moving in with you. There's the monetary piece of it. You know, your social security or your pension was comfortable. You were able to support yourself. You weren't thinking about sneakers and daycare and lunch money and all of those things. And then you have those kids have for some period of time before they arrive at your doorstep, they've been living in a pretty chaotic situation. So they come with all of that emotional baggage. And they're also kids who they've grown up for the most part with the model for how we deal with things is we self-medicate. It's not going to be unusual that they're going to best be experimenting, maybe find themselves with the problem <coughs> themselves, and as the grandparents who are dealing with that. And then there's the practical piece. You know, April vacation was a couple of weeks ago. We had lots of parents, grandparents calling us to say, where can I get help? You know, it's, I got my grandchildren. I'm doing the best I can. I'm sending them back and forth to school. I got a whole week now. Where, where can they go? What do I do with them? Is there, you know, they don't know about the boys and girls clubs. It's been 40 years since you raised them kids. So there's those kind of services that people need. And then just jumping up to the, how to protect yourself. I talked a little bit about monitoring the medications. We gave you the file of life and that proper storage. And then that all important getting rid of the prescriptions that you have out there. You know, and I've talked a lot about what the problem is, what the ways you can keep yourself safer. But we certainly know that there's nothing that conveys as well what people go through or how it impacts families as that personal reflection. So as I said, Carrie Ann's here today to talk a little bit about where she's been, where she is now, and what happened to people in her life on the way. So once she gets through being a rock star back there with the <laughs> microphone, come on up. recovering heroin addict. Um, on June 3rd, coming up, um, I'll have three years. Clean. Um, and I struggled with addiction for about a decade. Um, I didn't grow up in a, in a home where there was like abuse, drug addiction, alcoholism. I, I grew up in a home where like both my parents worked and they thought they were doing the best for me and they put me in like after school programs and sports. And um, I was a very active child. I liked more and I liked to get into trouble and I liked chaos. And um, so, you know, as I grew up, I, I kind of hung out with the crowd that was not doing the right thing. That seemed like more fun to me. 
and by the time I was um, 19, I had like just, I just kind of got by in high school, barely graduating, and I, I didn't do anything extra. I, I, I never really thought about going to college. I didn't have any dreams. Um, I just really just wanted to have fun. And when I was 19, I had a procedure, and I was prescribed um, Percocets. And that prescription was done within like, I want to say a day, maybe, maybe, maybe two at the most. And like, I thought I literally found uh, the cure. I'm like, how come everybody doesn't try this? This is fantastic. I feel great. I had no idea what came with that prescription. I, I grew up in the time where it was like, just say no to drugs. You know, my mom kind of taught me, you do drugs, you're going to die. There wasn't really anything in between. Um, and unfortunately, like I had to find out for myself that it was a very long and painful road. Um, I started getting arrested very young. I started committing crimes due to my addiction. And like what started off as Percocets then led to Oxy caught in 80 milligrams. And um, like the slideshow said, it was $80 for, for that one pill. So um, I didn't really have a great job at the time and, and the person that I was with was supplying my habit at that time, but that went away very quickly. And um, never did I think that I was going to be a homeless heroin addict, sticking you know, a needle in my arm to um, feel some type of relief. Um, in that addiction, many of the examples that have been given, I have done myself. And it wasn't um, a personal attack. It wasn't to hurt anybody in my family. It wasn't to cause any tension. In that moment, I needed to feel better. So I would go around my grandmother when um, she had a doctor's appointment, so she needed a ride just so I could get some sort of money. I'd go around my grandfather, collect all his change because I knew he had jars and jars of change up in his room. Um, and the whole entire time I wasn't present. I was not, I was not um, mentally present. It was for the next, for the next. And, and soon enough, um, I, I ended up homeless and um, trying to get into detoxes, trying to get into programs, um, but I wasn't ready. I, I thought that was everybody else had a problem. I really didn't think I had a problem. I thought this is just what people did. And obviously nobody really ends up homeless in Lowell. And um, what led me to Lowell is the, the price. What went from $80 went down to $5 for me. So um, it was easier to um, get the fix that I needed. And um, in that time, like I caused my family a lot of pain. I caused, I, I caused my mother a lot of pain, I caused my, um, my grandparents a lot of pain, my siblings a lot of pain. I thought I was just only hurting myself. I didn't realize that I was affecting everybody in my life, and I, and I was. Uh, and so around 26 years old, I started going to treatment programs, and I'm going to be honest, it was really just to get the court system you know, away from me. I, I, just, I didn't want to be in jail, I didn't want to go to jail. I, didn't think jail was for me, and um, I I basically stayed in and out of programs from 26 to 29 years old, either either in programs or, or on the streets. And at 29, um, after having uh, picked up some more criminal charges, and my probation officer realizing like something, she needed to intervene. Something needed to happen. Um, she wanted to serve me my time. And that's when drug court stepped in. And thank God they did because um, if, I, if I was left to my own devices, if, if, it was, if, if the choices were, were left to me, I would be out on the street getting high. Because at the end of my addiction, I didn't know how to shower, I didn't know how to make my bed, I didn't really even know how to communicate, I didn't know how to pay bills, I didn't know how to make doctor's appointments. Um, because for 10 years, the only thing that I was concerned about was getting my next high. So as everybody else was maturing and growing up, I, I, I stopped. I completely stopped. And um, that was a scary place to be at 29 years old, where I should be. I should know how to pay bills. I should know how to apply for a job. I didn't. Um, so when 
um, when I took the jail time, um, they, they offered drug court, thank God they did. I, I was sent to a program for all women because I needed to focus on myself. Um, and they taught me, they taught me how to live. They taught me how to be held accountable. They taught me how to make my bed. They taught me how to have a schedule. They taught me that like, maybe you shouldn't go home right now because that's where this all started. Um, and in that time, drug court, uh, drug court honestly opened up doors that would have never been, would have never been open for me. And they believed in me at a time when my family could not even believe in me. They wanted to, but I had countless times failed them. Um, and in the end, today, I am married. I, we just bought our house. Um, I work at a treatment facility in Wilmington called Bannon Treatment Center, and I am the house manager for the female house in Somerville. So, which was three years ago, seemed like um, a hopeless story has like turned into the, the greatest blessing in the world. But um, the only thing I can say from my own experience is just to be aware. Um, I just recently came up on a situation where we were having contractors come into our house. My husband owns a contract, a construction company, but these are outside people. And it's funny how the tables have turned because now somebody was in my house doing drugs in my house and, and I find them. And, um, and in that I'm like, I have to be aware of who's coming into my home. I can't, I can't just trust anybody that's coming into my home because in all reality, I would have done the same thing. Um, Anybody offering extra assistance, I would be aware of it. Usually there's a motive. Um, and just like protect yourself. You know, don't carry too much money on you if you're, if you're walking out at night or if you're walking around. Lock your car doors, lock your bedroom doors, anybody, um, or your house doors. Anybody coming to sell you anything or, I heard a story a few weeks ago, the cable guy, the cable guy came in and then somebody had something missing. That, that's not that surprising. He's, he's welcomed in the home, you walk away, you leave something on the table, yeah, it would be taken. Um, and, I don't know, at the end of it, like, it's not a personal attack, it's, it's not, that the, the addict is not trying to the hurt the family member or, or the person that they're going into their home or, or stealing the medication from. But really, the um, only thing that's really trying to happen is like fuel that, that feeling of death. It's almost, it's, it's, it's like caging up an animal that I need to get out of the cage. That's what it feels like trying to feed your, your addiction. So, um, I don't know. Thank you, Marion. I love Marion. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. is just that she is so willing to come and help. Mm -hmm. I never call her and say, I'm going somewhere. Will you come with me? So that people can see the face of somebody who's a success and really hear the first hand piece. So we're very grateful to her. Mm -hmm. We're very grateful. I'm grateful for you. Thank <laughs> everything everything that I was told to do I did because the alternative was being in jail whereas like I wasn't a murderer I had a drug addiction and so um, keeping me away for a little while like we call it um, we say you have to put your you have to arrest your disease my disease needed to be arrested at a, for a period of time where I could clear up the fog in my head and I could get a little moment of clarity and then I, I wasn't given much freedom though. But also like my pain was great enough. I didn't I didn't want to continuously end up hurting my mom, disappointing my mom, disappointing my family, disappointing myself. Um, 
and, and I was lucky enough to go to an all women's facility in Lynn that it was visible that this was achievable. <laughs> Everywhere else, it didn't seem like, it, it seemed false to me. Mm. But um, even with the time that I have right now, I still have to do no, anything and everything I am asked to do, I do. Because I don't, I don't want to take anything away to see what will actually bring me back to that lifestyle. And you know, one of the things that Carrie Ann said, she went in and out of treatment programs, and that's one of the benefits, it's been a benefit of the drug court, is that people who can't figure out themselves to get themselves there are told, this is where you show up. One of the things we've started across our county now is, because we kept hearing from people who said, my adult child, grandchild, whatever, you know, is doing all kinds of things to me. I don't want them to go to jail. I don't want them to have a criminal record, but I want it to stop. So we put together a pre-arraignment diversion program where somebody gets arrested for either a possessory drug offense or an offense um, that is fueled by addiction, like you're writing bad checks on grandma's account because of your addiction. We have partnered with some treatment agencies for a 16-week outpatient program. Inpatient's better. Everybody can't go to inpatient. And many times, if you've got anything that you've hung on to in your life, you still have your kids, you still have a job, we want you to be able to do that. But you go to that 16-week program, you complete that program, so you get the treatment piece plus an aftercare plan. You do that, we will not go forward with your charges. So, you know, lots of times when people, as Carrie Ann said, when people are deep in addiction, it's easy to say there's treatment out there, why don't you go get it? I mean, I'll give you an example. We one day in our office tried just calling around, trying to get ourselves into treatment and figure all that out. We were stone sober, English was our first language, and we kind of know how to work the system, it's pretty impossible. Your head would explode trying to figure out how to get treatment. You know, call back at 11.30 and talk to ABC, whose voicemail you keep getting, and you know, tell me the last four digits of the area code, we, of the zip code where you used to live. It's very, very hard. And if you think about trying to do that when you're in addiction, it's not really a recipe for success. Uh, to tag on to that, because I've, I've had a situation that I've had with somebody with the same thing. My question is, we're, we're seeing so much about um, the, the, the numbers going up so much. Obviously, there isn't enough centers around um, to accommodate people, a lot of people into these, that need to get into these programs. Is the state looking into you? You know, the, there's a two-fold piece of that. I mean, in Massachusetts, despite what everybody says, is there ever going to be enough? I don't know. But we have a lot of treatment facilities. And it also depends on what you mean by treatment. You know, detox beds, we have more detox beds than are probably filled on any given day. But treatment is kind of like this hourglass. you got to go to detox, just get the drugs out of your system. Then you got to go to a treatment program. Then you got to have aftercare. Mm -hmm. You know, it, probably the biggest place that we have a lack is in the actual active treatment place. But the other place, the other piece is you got to be willing to go. And they got to be ready when you go. Because as Carrie Ann said, well, when you have that moment of clarity of like, OK, something bad happened, I really want to go. It's not really helpful to say, well, we have a bed for you in three weeks. Because the likelihood is you're going to have found your way back to using mm -hmm. in those three weeks. So there's a coordination piece of all that. I mean, that's one of the reasons that an outpatient program at least is a way to get somebody going. It's also why we give you know these resources. For instance, one of the places that's a great um, source of help is Wicked Sober. Because Wicked Sober will help you put a plan together. So if you have a kid who's in addiction, maybe today they have absolutely no interest in going to help. But you can call them and say, if my kid next Tuesday says they're willing to get help, what will we do? Like you really, if you, you're the family of an addict, you can't wait till the kid comes and says, now I'd like to get help. You gotta have that plan because you're only gonna have a little bit of time to get them in someplace. Otherwise, they're gonna wander off. We have a lot of people who die of an overdose, you know, maybe they got released from a program, they moved back home, they had this pipe dream that they're gonna get into some program nearby, and in those days, they are more at risk because their system's clean of drugs, and it's, I'm gonna have, you know, one more shot for the road, and they go get something and they die from that. Yeah. And one, one more question, the, the, that's been coming, that's coming new into the, to the news, 
is the drug that's out there that's coming in. I don't know what country it's coming in from, but it's the one that green of it. Carfentanil is incredibly dangerous because it's dangerous not only to the users, obviously, it's dangerous to all the first responders, it's right. dangerous to the medical providers because it is so, so deadly, even the touching it, breathing it, whatever. Mm -hmm. We are very fortunate that we haven't seen it yet in Massachusetts, but they've had three up in New Hampshire. They buy it on the internet. I mean, it's not, you know, and that's the other piece when you talk about law enforcement that really has had to do all kinds of other things that they hadn't had to do before, but also how you do the enforcement piece. You know, people will say, well, can't you send people out on the corner and stop this drug trafficking? Nobody's selling drugs on the corner anymore, really. It's all set up by phone messages, like everything else, you know. I don't go, not that it never happens, but it's not the usual practice that somebody's going to go stand on the street corner and buy. They texted, they sent a, an instant message, and they're meeting up. Same thing, you know, people are just importing this stuff on the internet. It's pretty easy to buy. They traced back that car fentanyl in New Hampshire, internet search, that's how they got it. So is there a way that we, we can instill some kind of a, I, I don't know, some kind of a team, teamwork that they would have that would be able to keep an eye on those kind of things? I mean, we, we coordinate, the police departments are part of lots of organizations. The state police coordinate a lot of that, NEMLEC. Um, there's a lot of sharing of that information to try to stay ahead of it. You know, they're clever. There's a lot of money. Referring to coming in from China, the fentanyl is, is produced in China and is sent here. It's very difficult to stop that from coming in China. You know, their, their relationship with the United States isn't that great. So um, I'm not sure that they're all on the same page. And it's a big money maker. You know, it's, this is a cash business, and with this money, is going to be that illicit uh, use of getting in here. But for the right reasons, it, it does play a, a good role in the medical field, but right. clearly there's that wrong end of it, too. Hi. First of all, thank you for the oh, you the district attorney. Um, with the car fentanyl, I, I just want to get some clarification on that. With, if it's dangerous to the first responders, Okay, so How is it that they don't die from it? That's well, unclear to me. Well, <laughs> they take that chance, yeah. Right, right. I mean, but it, do they? It, the, the powder obviously ha could have could have an impact, on right. It, right? It doesn't necessarily have an impact. I just want to make sure I understand. So that the example that you gave before that there are three types of people: some people take it because they need it, yep. some people take it just temporarily, <coughs> some people fall for it. Okay. Um, so if, if a first responder goes there. Uh, and they catch a whiff of car fentanyl. All right, It'll, it may have one of those three effects on that individual. Is that because the same? Yeah, yeah. So we we use precautions: rubber gloves, masks, right. and we the same thing with the EMTs. There have been actual officers have overdosed on being exposed to it. There was a report of an officer had a little bit of powder on his shirt. He wiped it off and he mm -hmm. overdosed. He didn't die because you know there were there were um, treatment right there, but. That's the only way we're going to avoid overdosing from it is by using the proper precautions. So, the, you know, we're not going into a room filled with powder. It's right. more of covering it, you know, obtaining it as evidence at some point, depending on what the situation is. And it's and we continue to tell our officers, and, and there's alerts that I send out all the time, of how to properly handle it. It's, it's certainly not a good situation. It, it's yeah. also because the, the officers hopefully have not developed a tolerance to it where the person with the addiction probably has. That's why I think they're asking is why okay. is it affecting an officer for college? Yeah. Correct? And sometimes so. sometimes with the fentanyl though it's it's the stray fentanyl. You have you know the people that are, are packaging this is no science to it. They do what they can. They cut it, but sometimes they may not cut it the right way. So and <coughs> you're seeing a lot of overdoses are attributed to fentanyl that is essentially a hot dose because they're not mixing it properly. And that's going to happen. It's, just, it's kind of the same way if you take um, nitroglycerin for a heart condition. You take it to get your heart better. But if I took it, I could essentially right. have my own heart attack because it's affecting me more than with you because it's prescribed to you. They right. have a tolerance already built up to it where the officer or the EMT doesn't have they that have tolerance. Yeah. Thank you. So I think one of the biggest challenges we face in our community is when we invest in our law enforcement. Good investment. That's in our youth services. The problem is I think we have that gap is to get the people to the help. 
Mm-hmm. Something we struggle with even uh, financially when we talk about it. And we may not have had some discussions with <coughs> other communities that have had some success in making an investment in somebody that just focuses on helping people get to the help. Is it worthy of investment? Is that something that ultimately will save communities money in the law enforcement side and on the youth service side? Because we certainly haven't made a lot of time to focus on that, but it seems like that a problem is a lot of kids we know about that can't help them get there. And you know, the question is, and that's one of the things we've tried to do with our approaches, you know, do we need somebody working full time in all the 54 cities and towns to get people to No, not really. You know, but that's maybe something on a regional basis or whatever that you have somebody who can help funnel people to places. You know, we do a lot of work. All of our task forces are based in the hospitals. So we have a lot of connections with folks in the hospital. So, you know, somebody might come in, a parent brings a kid in, you know, the typical um, explanation, if you will, is they're having some kind of a seizure. Well, actually, they're overdosing. So, you know, we've worked a lot with the hospitals, so they know that. They're, they're there, the social workers are targeting people off to places. You know, some of the resources we have up there, the Quick and Sober, those kind of learn to cope, those are great sources for people to get somebody to help you know, I think one of the things, aside from all of the human cost and suffering, one of the things that we've tried to be conscious of and talking about is, first of all, there needs to be a system approach across it so that everybody's not doing the same thing. The other piece is, you know, we need to obviously treat people who have addiction. We need to be doing the prevention piece and whatever. We can't do that at the expense of everything else. So, you know, at some level, one of the reasons why in Middlesex, my goal has been, we're going to get these numbers down. Because the simple fact is, it's not sustainable to just continue to throw buckets of money at that. That's why we really encouraged cities and towns to work with each other. You know, to share, for instance, a lot of departments share a clinician, share something. Because right now it's attractive because you can get a grant or you can try to do whatever. But I don't know what you're going to do when that runs out. So you should be making a sustainable plan, whatever it is, whether you partner with Wakefield, you partner with somebody else, and you make an investment that you can support. Can I just say also, yeah. um, like I, I work with Arlington Overcoming Addiction, and so um, what we have worked with um, Wicked Sober and with the Arlington Police Department is um, having a few of us go in, take the courses as a recovery coach, and then anytime that there's a home where there's an overdose or there's a parent who suspects that their child may be um, on the road to addiction, most of us have the resources. So opposed to having Marion call, it would probably take a little while to, to actually get the, the, the bed for a detox or into a treatment facility. People, um, we've, we've teamed up with other towns, other facilities, so it kind of bridges the gap. Whereas if the parent were to call, it takes maybe a day or two. Whereas if we call, we may have already built a personal relationship that unfortunately, it shouldn't work that way, but it, it does help. And so anytime um, the police enter the house, they give out the business card, or they give the business card to, to the parent. Um, but also like with Malden Overcoming Addiction, they're building a resource center right now, and, and Hopefully, with the hopes of like that is the go-to spot for like Middlesex County, and having it be a place where if you need any resources for family, for um, child, they'll have all the resources at at the um, recovery center. So until that's in our town full time, um, we do have something similar. My name is Amy. I'm the director of youth services, and I have Leah here with me. She's um, the coordinator for our drug-free communities grant. And everybody should have on their tables this resource card. And I'm here to tell you that you might not need the help, but you are probably going to know somebody that needs some help. And um, we encourage you. We have the number on there for Wicked Sober and for uh, Learn to Cope, but also my number's on there under Youth Services. Any of the families that you might know, friends, whatever, they can call me and I will help them make those phone calls. It is not easy. I'll echo what you said. It is sometimes a six-hour process. Sue from Veterans has gone through this with us as well. Just finding that open bed, but also getting them there in time and in that window, which is really a short window sometimes. So I would just ask that everybody take this. If you'd like extras, Lee and I have them. And not necessarily for you, but you might have somebody confide in you at some point. I'm worried about my, my cousin, my sister, my nephew, and you can give this out, okay? And the other thing is um, the magnet here. We have a very active drop-off box at North Reading Police. You do not need to make an appointment to drop off your prescription medications, your unused prescription medications. 
please take more of those. And we have two more things for everybody. Leah, can you help me out? Um, Leah's going to come around and hand all of these to you. The community impact team realizes that not everybody can get to the drug take back boxes. We have residents here who are not able to get down to the police station. So we're going to hand out these bags. Every one of these bags is for um, self-disposal. Each one can hold 45 pills or up to six ounces of liquid or up to six patches. You put it in here, you follow the directions on the back, adding a little water, seal it, and you can throw it in your trash. It deactivates the medication, it protects you. If you would like any of these, any more of these, please take another one from Leah. We will also commit to bringing them to any of your friends that cannot get out of their houses. I will drive them to their houses and drop them off, okay? Please take these and use these. Uh, we are investing in making sure that your houses are safe. The other thing that we're giving out are um, not just the pill bottles, but really the important part is the cap. It's a timer cap, and this is great for two things. One, for anybody who might forget when the last time they took their medication was, it resets the timer. But also it'll tell you if somebody opened your prescription bottle. Okay. These fit most bottles. If you if it does not fit your prescription bottle, call me and I will bring a different one that might fit better. Okay. We really want to make sure that you're keeping your medication safe if you cannot get them out of the house. And the other thing is, Chief Murphy, along with some of our chiefs, has committed to if for some reason you can't get them out of your house and you don't want to use the bag or whatever, call the police station and somebody will stop by your house and pick them up and get them to the box. So you don't, you know, you're not sure about that. You can't get down there. They'll come get them, Brian. Gloria. Oh, um, I just wanted to say that um, there recently was a drug bring back day, whatever, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, advertised. However, drugs could be brought to the, any police station every day, every day. And I think that that needs to be advertised more frequently. We used to have it. Well, sometimes it's part of the police blotter. We did have it added to the police blotter in the transcript. However, other newspapers should do the same thing to, you know, tell the people that they can bring back any uh, needles, syringes, drugs can go every day. Because the police station is open 24-7. You're right. And then we try to encourage people that best. We hope people get that message because you walk in there, you just throw them in the box, they're happy to get rid of them for you. That, yeah. that is being published in our newsletter when it goes out the mail to 2200 homes. So oh, good. All the information about how well your program went, about this program, is all going on the next newsletter. Great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else any other questions? Well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you.